Welcome to Superchargers. I'm Daniel Thomas. Let's go. G'day guys, thank you so much for tuning in. My guest on this episode is Chris Rudin. Chris is a world record holding powerlifter and a professional speaker who appeared on the Rocks TV show, Titan Games. During our chat, Chris shared how he stopped hiding his disability and is now empowering others through his experience. He has a new book coming out, The Art of Changing Course. Enjoy this one, guys. Let's get into it. Firstly, if you could give the listeners a bit of background on on your disability, and also, yep. I'm really interested. Was do you think it was a sort of one significant shift when you started to to stop hiding it and and embracing it, or was it a a, a build up of of steps and stages? Yeah, man, I don't I don't really think there is like this one Disney moment of like everything got better. And I think even though as bad as we want that, it never really happens that way. There can be a few powerful moments that like start change, you know, but for me, there was there's quite a few. But for those of you who might not have heard of me, my name is Chris Rudin. Uh, I was born with two fingers on my left hand and a shorter left arm and I also have type one diabetes. So despite that, I, I hid my disability for almost 20 years, about 17 years. And uh, my entire life, I just kind of felt like a monster. You know, I felt like I was broken. And you think about some of the synonyms for disability, like weak or broken or useless or helpless. And a lot of people identify disability with broken. And I know I did as a kid growing up because I was made to feel that way. You know, I always knew that I was different. People always stared at me and I had a lot of humiliating situations for a condition I never asked for. So fast forward, you know, 17, 20 years, I started finding a way to like live my life the way I wanted to. And now I speak all around the world. I was on a TV show at The Rock, all these magazines, all this really cool stuff, social media. But most importantly, I'm able to like live my life and not just be that broken kid who is terrified of going outside and being seen, you know? But I'm I'm tipping all those situations and scenarios on a daily basis when you were a kid. I'm tipping they just build layers and layers of adversity, right? Because yeah, I guess it's, I guess it's one of those things you I guess try and like, numb it out. Yeah, like even just the simple things like going into a shop or, you know, the things that other people take for granted, you you would have been continuously confronted with these stigmas and judgments and stuff. But from that, this kind of gift of like resilience and um you, you know taking these these little instances as really big opportunities for growth was that the way you saw it or were you more just sort of it was beating you down a little bit like you say in those early days man i never really saw the benefit uh probably until getting out of you know high school grade school and i I was like, there has to be more to life than just being this broken diabetic kid. You know, I had a disability and autoimmune disease and I'm like, there has to be more to life. And it's funny you said gift. I think a lot of us are waiting for a gift to be given, but instead for me, it was, I had to create the gift myself. You know, I had to take the situation that I had and turn it into something that was a little bit better for me and in turn better for other people around me. I've always been a big proponent of you teach best what you need to learn most. So for me, I started looking inward and I'm like, all right, communication, self-communication. I'm really not good at it because clearly I'm beating myself up over it or I'm just numbing it out and being apathetic towards the entire situation. What could I do to help other people that would also help myself? Getting into mental health talks and speaking about communication drastically helped not only me, but the people I speak with, organizations, all this stuff. But I realized our internal narratives are messed up. You know, we have these terrible stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, about everything we're doing in life, everything we want, about the world. And we wonder why, you know, we're constantly unhappy and we're constantly struggling. It's really hard to go against the narrative that's inside your own head. Yeah, it can be pretty brutal that uh internal voice that just just keeps going at going at you I've, i had a I had an awesome mentor say to me once um um get yourself right and everything else will fall into place as opposed to sort of 
looking outward for, for the answers, as you say, like external stuff. It's like, just, just focus on getting, getting yourself right. And then the other things, but I, but I love what you're saying about, um, you know, making the gift yourself, taking it into your own hands, like not, not, you know, not waiting, like just, you know, it's cliche, but life is short. Yeah. I mean, life, life is literally what you make it. And until you accept the responsibility of making it something better than you currently have, you'll always be hoping for a handout. And if you're like me, you're born without a hand. So there's definitely no handouts coming out, you know? Um, you, so many people are just hoping things will change. They think time will fix it. They think, you know, forgetting it will fix it and pushing it off to the side. They think obsessing it will fix. Nothing is going to fix it because in reality, you can't fix what you're not willing to face. And I remind myself that all the time. What am I not willing to face right now? What am I running from? What am I hiding? And I love those kind of Socratic questions that position me and position other people to address the elephant in the room or the real issue, not just the superficial issue. Because for me, I didn't hide. I didn't show my hand. You know, I hid my hand in a pocket and in a glove. And I did that for almost 20 years. But it wasn't that I was afraid of showing my hand. I was afraid of what people might say, maybe. But in reality, going layers and layers deep to find the root cause, I was afraid that maybe people would look at me and then it would confirm what I felt about myself, that I was broken, that I wasn't worth it. You know, I was afraid of my own narrative being seen literally by myself. And that's something I can control at all times, similar to what your mentor said. I used to operate with this conditional philosophy of if I didn't have this disability, then I would be happy. And how many people operate with that philosophy of if I just had more business, then I would be happy. If I just looked this way, then I would be happy. If I just had this many followers, then I would be happy. And that conditional philosophy needs to be flipped. If I just found a way to be happy, then maybe all of these things would happen. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't fix my disability. But there's an option to find quality of life when you stop chasing happiness through conditions that it, it's really hard to set yourself up for success if you say you can't be happy until, you can't find contentment until, well, damn, that that kind of sucks. You know, you're constantly chasing it and it's a carrot on the stick for the rest of your life. That's kind of how I felt. Yeah, flip the narrative. Um, so when you did flip that narrative... Did it kind of re like people's people's response and everything? Did that sort of uh, restoring you a kind of faith in people? And were you quite um, once you lent into that discomfort, like you say, were you were you like pleasantly surprised, or did it have other challenges that came with getting to the truth of things? So, originally, one of the first events that I really remember forcing myself to hide my hand. I was in middle school. There was a girl named Crystal and I had finally worked up the courage to like ask her out. You know, we're 12 years old, 13 years old. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm a guy, you know, I'm a, I was a boy at the time and uh, trying to talk to a girl and I'm like, hey, you know, trying to flirt with her. I don't know what I'm doing. My friend started laughing. I'm like, guys, stop. You know, you're, you're going to mess this up. And I turned back around and she is literally making fun of my hand with the stapler, calling me claw boy in front of the entire class. So not only did I get to not go on my first ever date, which I was very hopeful for, you know, I got made fun of by the girl I liked the most at the time. So from that moment, there was other moments of that kind of either humiliation or just like degradation. And um, I told myself, I'll never stop hiding my hand, you know. I got to the point where I was like, if I ever got a prosthetic arm, which I have now, um, I would show my hand. And I finally got approved for a prosthetic arm, which is really, really hard in the United States. Our healthcare is not always the best. So I remember the first time I took my glove off and I stopped hiding my hand. I was at a gym and a kid I had just met, this guy, we were talking, he was super cool. And he's like, oh, what happened to your hand? And usually I would just like kind of put it behind my back and try and redirect the conversation. But that time specifically, 
I just took the glove that I was wearing off because I used to work out. And I was like, oh, I was just born with two fingers. He's like, okay, cool. And I was like, what? Why did I expect him to have some massive reaction? Because I've been hiding it for so long. I expected, you know, confetti and explosions and, you know, doves flying out and stuff. But he didn't care. And what I realized is most people don't care. Most people don't care about what you're doing. Most people don't care about what you're insecure about. Most people don't care about you in the gym or whatever you're doing. And this whole time I was telling myself, everyone cares so much. Everyone is just so obsessed with you not being perfect. I'm like, no, it was just me. It was me who was obsessed with being perfect and me who was obsessed with hiding. And people didn't mind whether I hid or not. And it was such a freeing moment to realize, wow, I could have probably done this a long time ago, but I'm really glad I'm here now. I can really relate to that, man, in a different sense. Um, you know, I had a difficult family loss, losing my mother. And I used to talk about it in the same way. I used to brush it off for other people's, you know, they'd say, oh, how did you die? I'll try, try and probe a little bit. And I would just brush it off for the sake of everyone else. But I realized I was like, not only, not only lying to myself, um, you know, obviously I sort of wanted to protect people from complex, you know, from heavy, heavy stuff, but actually the ex exactly like you, when it, when I just kind of pulled the bandaid off and called it how it was in turn, I realized people were like, people are equipped. People are cool. Like they're, they're, they're okay to, to handle this stuff, you know? And it was sort of like a, um, a muscle in talking you know, I just had to work that muscle more because I hadn't, hadn't been working that, you know, and it was just every time I kind of told that, you know, brushed things off, I, I realized I was just kidding, kidding myself. And that was just very unfulfilling, you know, and the more I, the more open I was, the more people, the more, this is what I was touching on earlier, the more I, my faith in kind of um, humankind was restored because people were so non-judgmental and understanding and it had their own experiences so like whatever form these things take i think it's a similar a similar thing to be able to accept and talk and and have a faith you know push back against this fear it's pretty cool see it plays into it really plays into the narrative that we give other people we say oh they they want, they don't want to be bothered. They, this is too heavy for them. This is something they want to understand. We just write it off. And because we write it off, we, that's how we feel. We feel like it might be too heavy for them, but you have to remember that feelings are not facts, but somewhere along the way we have confused feelings for facts and we operate as if the feeling we have is a fact that really screws us up because I felt like I couldn't show my hand. And I knew that I couldn't show my hand because of that feeling, but that's not knowledge. That's a feeling. And we get so sure of things because of how we speak. And that's part of what I talk about now on stages of a new book coming out similar to the whole subject of like changing course. The communication and language we use can either keep us stuck or it can help us move forward. And for me, it kept me stuck for a long time. And I'll do a quick little exercise with you now. Are you a morning person or a night person? Um, I've become more of a morning person, I think. Yeah. Okay. So whenever I say that, I always make the joke and I say, you're a liar. And everyone <laughs> looks at me like I'm crazy. Um, you're not necessarily a morning person. You just have a habit of waking up early now. Mm. Same thing with a night person. You're not a night owl. You're just a person who goes to sleep later. That's a habit. I'm not a gym person. I just have a habit of going to the gym. I wasn't always a gym person. I became one, but that's not who I am because at any time you can change your habits. And if you can change your habits at any time, that means you're never stuck. That means there's always hope. There's always possibility for change. What do people do when they're, oh, I'm just lazy. I'm just, I just never finish anything. No, 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 no. You've had a habit of being lazy in the past. Absolutely. But that's not who you are because who you have been is not who you have to be moving forward. And for me, that thought released me from the prison of I'm going to be here for the rest of my life. This is how it's always going to be. No, at any moment, a small shift or a big shift can change everything. 
And that change can either happen from you or because of something else that you decide to react to. So we're in a lot more control than we think. And it took me a long time to learn that. Mm. Not to rip too many cliche internet quotes, but there's one I like, which is we're under no yeah. obligation to be the same person we were yesterday, which is exactly what you see. Yeah, exactly that. what you're saying. And it's true. Like new day, but these little habits also have these kind of, they're almost like compound interest. You know, you, you make a little change and then that also this habit stacking works awesome, which I've tried, you know, this stacking one habit onto another. If you already have a practice that you do add something else to it, because it's already in place and then that it's easier to, you know, and it's not like, um, it's not like airy fairy or rocket science stuff. It's, it's, it's like you're nope. saying, we, we have it within us to, you know, to, to change these little things. And, and like you say, that the narratives, the stories that we tell ourselves are so powerful, especially around fear. You know, I'm, I'm a natural kind of storyteller. So that, that within me is just a strong, so I will have the ability to like predict an event, you know, all the worst things that can, can happen. And then, and then you, you go there and it's, it's never what you think it's going to be. It never plays out how you think it's going to be. So these... it's funny that you said that word. I have a, a painting somewhere. It's from Seneca, the stoic philosopher. Oh, yeah. And it says, we often suffer in our imagination more than we do our reality. And that thought process has really like kind of changed the way I think. I'm like, why am I suffering twice? If it's going to happen already, why should I suffer in advance? Why am I feeling the pain of something that has not happened yet over and over and over until it finally happens just for me to realize it wasn't as bad as I thought? Why am I paying all of this pain for no reason? You know, and people are like, oh, easier said than done. Absolutely but better done than said, you know, going to work is easier said than done. It's really easy to say, go to work than it is to wake up at 6am and get up and get ready and do all this stuff, but you still do it. It's the same thing with the whole better done than said. When you start catching yourself like, Oh, spiraling, this is going to be terrible. It's going to be awful. Like, how are you such a mind reader and a predictor? Like, how do you know that? Or do you just feel that way? Again, separating feeling from fact, separating who you used to be with who you want to be, I guess, if you want to be just having better thoughts or using questions to get better ideas, we can separate that. It just takes time and pacing to be like, hey, listen, let's not spiral out of control here today. Let's let's ask questions. Is this thought helpful or hurtful? Is this going to help me or is this going to kind of set me back? Is mm -hmm. there something else I could think about this situation? And that process started the groundwork for what I teach around the world now to different organizations on change and overcoming adversity. So um, a lot of it is anecdotal experience from my own personal life, but I've worked with hundreds, if not thousands of people at this point. And uh, it's exciting to see when people start to change those narratives. I love that it's anecdotal because I think that just gives you a real especially in this day and age, it just gives you such a, a platform to come from. So I'm always interested in people's backstories because it's, it's easy to get on a video and kind of spruik some motivational thing. But when, when it's oh, coming yeah. from this, this place where you've had to like confront this stuff over and over and over your entire life, it, it, it just has so much more honest weight to it. And that's what I, I really pride myself in, whether it's as an author or a speaker, just a, a human being. Authenticity for me is I went through hell. I constantly have those battles. And it's, I guess you could say battles, but struggles. We all have those struggles, you know, and everyone said, how did you just become so motivated? How did you just overcome your disability? I didn't overcome anything. It's a daily thing. There's no finish line to mental health. There's no finish line to like real success. You know, it's a constant work in progress because we're alive. So be alive, allow it to continue. It doesn't have to have a finite end. You know, for me every day, I look at myself and I get to decide what I see. I get to decide how I act and react and I don't always do it well. I do make mistakes as everyone does. And then I try and catch myself and get back to where I need to be. But that process people see it now like oh you're just so lucky L luck has nothing to do with it 
I've went through some of the worst stuff that someone could imagine with a disability, with substance issues, with wrong crowds and everything in between. Lost businesses. I've made lots of mistakes. And looking back, it's all led to where I am now. And this is the exact or even better than the quality of life that I ever imagined. Because I gave myself the grace to make mistakes and pick myself back up. And it was not easy. And there was times I wanted to quit. There's times I tried to quit. But I'm very thankful that I didn't, you know, and that's the best thing I could say to anyone listening is it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to want to quit. That's okay. You don't have to be motivated 100% of the time. Anyone who says they're motivated 100% of the time either has a trust fund that <laughs> money is coming in without struggle or they're lying, you know, um, the best of the best make mistakes. And I've learned that from mentors I've worked with and it's okay. Um, the question is like, how are you going to recover and rebuild when it's time? Mm, it, the hindsight h hindsight is classic as well the um you know when we're in something we don't realize at the time and then and then in time the hindsight's a wonderful thing because you're like i know why that had to happen <laughs> you know oh yeah i get and we it we know that we know that for a fact that hindsight is crazy powerful because think about the worst thing you've ever been through in your life and you were like there's no way i'm going to survive this you've survived every one of those moments you've survived every moment you told yourself you weren't going to survive yeah, it's Everything important. you said, there's no way you're going to make it. You did. It's important to keep that in context sometimes I find as well. Like if something's a seemingly stressful situation or whatever, when you put it in context to other events in one's life and you go, well, I, I was able to kind of get through that or not overcome as we say, but, you know, learn from that or whatever it may be. It does help put things in context. I often have to remind myself and say, dude, you know, compare this scenario to some other things that you've, you've been in through, you know, this yeah. in theory should yeah. be a walk in the park, but I'm, you know, once I'm allowing, as we've said that, that narrative or that, um, you know, the feeling to be reactionary and stuff, it can kind of, uh, take on a thing of its own, but context, you know, in terms of where you've come, where you've been, I think that's important as well. Um, you talk a lot about, uh, you know, helping people who are just, just stuck. Um, and perhaps this ties in with a, with a tradition on the show, which is to have, have guests offer listeners, some kind of daily practice or challenge, maybe something that's benefited you. Um, it often comes back to like bringing an awareness to something, you know, it doesn't have to be some big grandiose thing. Is there anything that, that comes to mind for somebody that may be struggling? Absolutely. So uh, with my new book, I have tons of like very practical advice to get unstuck. And it's a, a different process. My whole thing is language first, we have to fix language because language is kind of the default setting of what we do everything with. And if you go through life with ineffective language, language that says, I can't really do this. Uh, I've reached my peak, you know, this is, this isn't going to be easy. If you use language that is constantly setting you up for either failure or less than optimal performance in anything, relationships, business, life. It's really hard to win when your mind is almost against you, you know, so creating language is huge, but I'm going to give you one of my most popular, very direct processes that you can put a filter through anything. So if we picture a triangle and I can actually send you the picture after this, in the bottom corner, we have catch, top, challenge, bottom, change. So catch, challenge, change is the process that I filter everything through. To be, to fix any problem, you have to be aware of it. So you have to be able to catch it and say, hey, this isn't really, this isn't really it. When you say things like, oh, I always mess things up. You have to catch that. You have to be able to, to see it and acknowledge it and be aware of it. You have to challenge that because always every time you always mess things up it's a hundred percent of the time you've never gotten anything right in your life ever or are you being a little bit extra are you are you putting a little salt on this you know um and if if you find that you are which 10 times out of 10 you are you have to change that like okay i don't always mess this up but i've messed this up four times I'm like wow four four out of how many times have you got things right? 
I'm not really good at math, but I can tell you the odds are that you've done this better than not, you know? And when we put things through that catch challenge change process, we start to rewire neuroplasticity, this whole process of being able to change the way we think, we start to rewire the way we think and believe and act. It sounds like complete BS in the beginning because you're so conditioned to have negative responses, you've gotten really good at it. And if you were really good at playing basketball and I immediately went, told you to go to golf, you would be like, oh, sports, that doesn't make sense. This is complete. Yeah, it's a different skill. It's a different skill and you have to give yourself time to put this process to work. But when you're able to be aware of what's going on and actually challenge and change the language or concepts that you're doing that are actually hurting you, then we can start to make small compound effect of change over time and thoughts that you usually had to be very active with to fix now naturally go through that process. Yeah. Language is massive. I've noticed, I've noticed when I start to fall a little bit, the language can, I notice it changing, you know, I do have this awareness, but it's like, yeah, the words we use, as you've said, they can just, they can kind of expose you know, they, they can say so, so much. And yeah, just that active, active change can be really, really significant. So yeah, I do a really uh, fun kind of call out with people when I'm an audience is talking about change and conditioning and language. And I'll have the audience uh, say silk five times as fast as you can to so like silk, 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 silk. And I'll ask them, what do cows drink? And they're like, milk. And I'm like, no, they drink water, you know, <laughs> but because the conditioning and rhyming and words were just like thrown at you so fast, they immediately reacted and said the thing that made sense in their head, mm. but it wasn't true. Mm. And that's what we do all the time. We just resort to what makes sense. And if we have a negativity bias because of our past or language that we've used, we are going to immediately jump to when something happens, it's neutral. Let's mention that events that happen are not negative or positive. They're just neutral. Mm -hmm. And how do, how do I know that? I'm sure you've had a flat tire before in your life. Oh, multiple times. My bike here in Germany okay. is just, yeah. What are, what are some feelings you get with a flat tire? Just throw out those feelings. It's actually a, yeah, that's a big one. It, it, it actually has the ability to kind of throw me into survival mode, you know, like you can't, yeah. you know, you need yeah. a better bike. Why haven't, you know, you still yeah, got this you cheap crappy that. bike and now, you know, you got to get mad. The, yeah. You're yeah, mad. Yeah, get, you're worried all that, but all of that's a lie. And how do I know that's a lie? Because when you pass someone with a flat tire, you don't think of any of those things. Hmm. Yeah, when true. you pass someone with a flat tire, you don't feel anger or frustration. You're having a great day. There's no problems. So it's never the flat tire. It's the fact that it's happening to us. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah. not the event itself, but it's the event and how we respond to it. So it's never the event. It's literally our spin on the event. So if we have the ability to take the same event and spin it in different ways, that means we're always in control of the language and our potential to make it a little bit better. Now, there's never a time where I'm going to get a flat tire and be like, oh, yes, I'm happy. No, that's that doesn't make sense. But there's no point in flattening the other tires because you're pissed off, mm. you know? And my thing is, okay, like how can I use language to my benefit and not my detriment? Um, it's, it's become a like lifelong practice to be like, all right, at minimum, I can always control what I say and how I start to feel or think. From there, I always have a good foundation to keep going forward. And it's it's a very hard practice because our mind naturally goes to survival mode, naturally goes to fear-based logic. So our mind wants to keep us safe. But safety, similar to sickness, sometimes you die from the protocol that the body gives you to, to fight the sickness. Increasing your body's temperature mm. is an attempt to fight sickness. But sometimes that increase in temperature is actually what kills you. But that's what we do. We try to keep ourselves so safe that we stay stuck. And sometimes we have to take it off automatic mode and go go into manual, you know? I had a really uh, valuable experience when I was young. Just that you reminded me of it with the flat tires. Uh, I had a, a car loaded up full of drums and I was trying to get to a show I was playing out of Melbourne in Australia, like two hours out of Melbourne. And the club where the show was, was packed. There's like 300 people in there waiting 
for us to play there. And I'm driving in the heat in my car and the engine blew in the middle of nowhere. Mm. So I've got a car full of drums, a blown engine, and I called the guitarist and he said they're already on stage, right? Waiting for me. Oh, no. And so... I'm like, well, I can't call the, uh, the, the assistants because I, I was literally like Australian outback, like middle of nowhere, you know? Um, wow. and all those thoughts that we're talking about went through my head. Like, you're not going to make the gig. You're going to let 300 people down. You're going to, the band's going to fire you. Um, this is the end. This is the end of the world. Like you've like, your car's finished as well. How are you going <laughs> to, so it was all yeah. of these stimulus at once, you know? And uh, yeah, somehow I just let the engine cool down, managed to get it to start and literally floored it to the, to the club and it blew again, but I rolled the car to a stop outside the nightclub with a queue of, pe- where the oh queue of people God, waiting and like the smoke cleared and they're all looking at me like, what's going on with this guy? Um, and then I just ran the drums onto stage, played the set, got through the set and then just wild applause at the end. And I was like, this is what I mean in context. It was like, I was like, I didn't, I couldn't fathom at the end how I'd even got, got to the place, let yeah. alone fit, got through the show, you know, but it was all, but it think was about that. Yeah. Think about that. Think about how creative you were with everything bad that could happen and zero creativity with how it could have gone, gone well. Mm. Exactly. The way it actually went was a possibility but because our brain naturally goes to like the negative that wasn't even an option in your head luckily your body kind of took over and you're like all right let's make this work but every thought you had was about how you're going to mess up and how things are going to go bad and i have that too like it, we all are kind of predisposed to that safety survival mechanism of you can't fail if you don't try so the brain's like oh it's okay it's over it's done you know everything's broken like just just give up, you know, mm. and the best way to avoid a car accident is to never go outside, you know, but that's not really a practice for life. So it's funny that if we started being a little bit more curious on how things could go a little bit better and a little less certain on how things are going to go bad, we'd have an opportunity to make better decisions. And that's another practice that I teach is changing certainty for curiosity. You can't be certain that things are going to go bad or worse. You can't. It's it's not true. It's a feeling, but it's not a fact. But we can always be curious on how they might go a little bit better. Like, how can I survive this situation? How can I make it through? If there was a way, what would it look like? If we got a little bit more curious and a little less certain, I think a lot of problems would be either solved or positioned to be solved better. Yeah, curiosity is a great, great focus shift. Um, Absolutely. Is there a is there a piece of art like a film or or another book or anything that's had a profound impact on you, particularly in those times where you were questioning things? Absolutely. So, um, as an author, uh, my second book is coming out in September. Uh, I'm I'm guess I'm supposed to recommend my first book, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hold off on that. And I'm going to say the two books that actually had the most impact on my life. First one was The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Uh, That was really my introduction into a little bit of stoicism, which is, I guess, the best way to explain that is just learning to domesticate emotion so it doesn't rule your life, but you're not a robot. Learning to effectively move through life and effectively is the key, not good or bad, but effective and ineffective. Um, And going into therapy... I learned that effectiveness is a much better lens on life than good or bad, you know? So that Mm. really helped me navigate everything. From there, I found a book by an author named Brianna Weiss, 101 Essays That'll Change the Way You Think. She is an incredible writer, but the thoughts and processes in there, you can tell they're from someone who has just been in the dark and found her way through. And it's not personal stories, but it's, personal mindsets that you just know she was going through stuff at the time and it, it's it been so helpful you could flip through any page of that and it's literally 101 short essays that she's written throughout a period of time i've gotten probably the most value from any book in that specific book and it's it's been like the number one 
self-help book for like two years straight. It's crazy. So all these essays offer some kind of perspective, little perspective Wild. on like, yeah, definitely perspective on communication or processes or just you, you feel validated in knowing like, oh, wow, other people do feel this and there is a way through, you know? And I think it's nice to know whether men or women, we all get to those like dark places and some a little more severe than others, but there's always a way back and always a way out. Even when you feel like it's hopeless, that hopeless feeling is a feeling not a fact. And I guess I keep saying that because I want anyone who's listening to understand that it's not over. It's never over. And if it's over, you have nothing to worry about. So it's not over. There's always a chance, you know? Yeah. Awesome. Where can people find you? Yeah, I'm all over. So just my name at Chris Rudin, uh, Instagram, YouTube are like my main accounts, but also LinkedIn and everything else. And my website is chrisrudin.com. Uh, my new book coming out is The Art of Changing Course, and it's currently in pre-order. So pre-order until September 4th. Anything helps, you know, as an author, it's really great to get the word out about that stuff. But I truly put in years of work on this book, over 100 peer-reviewed sources to help people really get unstuck and change the course of their life effectively without all the motivational hoopla jargon, you know. Um, there's a specific process to start and sustain change that you want in life, even for when you feel stuck. So uh, it's my job to really be the person I never had growing up and help other people find their best quality of life. So that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. That's awesome, man. Well, like I say, I really appreciate, you know, the background from which you're coming from um, and all that you've been through to get to this, to this point. It's, it's inspiring and awesome to see. Um, and we've, we've covered quite a bit there in a short amount of time. So yeah, really appreciate it. Of course, man. I appreciate you having me. There you go, guys. Honest ratings for the show on Apple are appreciated. If you have 